Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you enjoy these kinds of videos, make sure to hit that subscribe button guys so you don't miss another video. Today's case is honestly so horrific. It's almost unimaginable to even believe that a crime like this could take place in an area where hundreds of children are present, a school, people all around. The killer could commit this crime and hide a body in the span of 30 minutes. We're gonna be talking about the tragic case of Colleen Ritzer. So let's jump in. Colleen Ritzer was born on May 13th, 1989 in Andover, Massachusetts, and her parents were Tom and Peggy Ritzer. She also had a brother, Tom Jr., and then a younger sister, named Laura. Colleen was loved by her family and friends and she loved them just as much. She was known to be a positive and happy girl and she attended Andover High School where she was a cheerleader and member of the National Honor Society. She then went to Assumption College where she studied math and psychology. Colleen had two passions and she dedicated herself to both of them. They were family and teaching. She had always wanted to be a teacher. She loved her teachers growing up and they inspired her and encouraged her to pursue her own passions. Over the course of her teaching career, she worked at a couple schools. So she was a student teacher at Hale Middle School and then she worked as a long-term substitute teacher at Gloucester High School. In 2012, when she was 23 years old, she began her first full-time teaching position at Danvers High School in Danvers. But I believe at the same time, she was also pursuing further studies. At Danvers High, she taught geometry and algebra to students in the ninth grade. And at this school, she quickly became a favorite amongst not only the students, but also the other teachers because she was someone who genuinely cared for the well-being of her students. She cared about helping her students perform well in school. She had this Twitter account I believe it was Miss Ritzer Math. And on this platform, she would share motivational quotes. She would share notes with her students. She would share videos that would help encourage them to be better, do better. She lived by this quote, every day may not be good, but there is something good in every day. She also offered students extra help after school. She would often stay back and hold these tutoring sessions for students that were struggling. Aside from teaching, Colleen loved her family and friends. They said she was an extremely loving person who just brought joy to those around her. She enjoyed baking, watching movies, shopping, spending time with family and friends and traveling. She loved country music and the color pink. Her parents were often complimented on how they raised such wonderful and kind children. Colleen was also extremely close with her brother and her sister. On October 22nd, 2013, it was a Tuesday, Colleen had been working at Danvers High School for around a year at this point. And it was a Tuesday, like I said, she was staying back after school to hold a tutoring session like she often did for some students that needed extra help. So I believe there were only two students present in class that day. One of them was Philip Chisholm. Now Philip was present in class earlier that day and Colleen approached him, complimented him on his drawing skills and let him know that she would like him to stay back after school that day so she could help him prepare for an upcoming test. So this tutoring session takes place with these two students and once it's done, Colleen, she gets up just before 3 p.m., leaves the classroom to go to the bathroom. Then at about 6.30 p.m., Philip had not returned home as yet and his mother, Diana, began to worry and she went to the school to look for him. When Diana looked for Philip in the school and couldn't find him, she reported him missing to the police. Philip usually had soccer practice after school, so they questioned his soccer teammates and they said, yes, we did see Philip earlier that afternoon, but he missed the team practice at 4 p.m as well as the team dinner at 6 p.m. The last they had seen of Philip was when he was running away from the soccer field, telling them he had something important to take care of. After learning that a student was missing, the school principal, Sue Ambrosovich, 
sends a mass email to all school faculty and staff letting them know that Philip Chisholm was missing. Around the same time, Sue gets a call from another math teacher, Sarah. She tells her that someone else is also missing, Colleen. Colleen still lived with her parents and she usually returned home straight after work. Her family was not only concerned that Colleen didn't return home, but the fact that she wasn't answering any calls, any texts, they knew something's not right. This was so unlike Colleen. She was very responsible, very in touch with her family. So her father, Tom, drives to the school to look for Colleen. When he gets there, he notices that her car is still parked at the school. Colleen's parents then called Sarah, the other math teacher, to see if she had seen Colleen. And that's when Sarah called the school principal to let her know that Colleen too was missing. So let's talk about Philip. So he was born on January 12th, 1999, which made him 14 years old at the time. He was originally from Tennessee and had recently moved to Danvers. So didn't know many people in the area, but he was known for being a good soccer player. It's reported that at the time, his mother was going through a difficult divorce and he did have two other siblings. He was exhibiting some antisocial behaviors. He was quiet and awkward and shy and had difficulty making new friends at school, but he did not have any real disciplinary problems or any other problems that were known. But now both him and his teacher are missing. The last known sighting of the both of them was after this after school tutoring session. The other student who was in the tutoring session revealed that during the session, Colleen brought up Philip's move from Tennessee. She began, you know, just questioning him, making small talk. And when she did, Philip grew visibly upset and Colleen immediately changed the subject. Even though she did that, Philip remained upset and began talking to himself before the tutoring session ended. There was no reason for Colleen or Philip to still be at school after this session. It seemed really strange that they were both missing. A few teachers went to search the school and Colleen's classroom and noticed that her belongings were no longer there, but her car was there. At this point, it had been hours since she was due to return home. So her parents at 11.20 p.m. reported her missing to the police. Her phone was tracked and a ping of her location showed her last known location as being near Holton Richmond Middle School, about 24 minutes away from Danvers High School. Then they also requested a ping of Philip's phone. His last known location was at the Hollywood Hits premiere movie theater. So the police go to look for him there, but he wasn't there. At this point, a search is now underway for Philip and Colleen at the school. At 12.30 a.m. on October 23rd, the Topsfield Police Department got a call that a young man was walking along Salem Road by himself. He was walking the wrong way on the highway. When officers pulled up to him, they immediately recognized him as Philip Chisholm from the missing persons report. This was good news, right? A missing child that was no longer missing. At first, officers noticed that Philip was wearing a ski mask and they didn't think anything of it because it was cold outside at the time. But when he was questioned as to what he was doing out there by himself, he told officers that he was coming from Tennessee, but going nowhere. Then the officers noticed blood on his hands and they immediately pat him down. They find a rock in his pocket, as well as a credit card with a woman's name on it, Colleen Ritzer. Now it doesn't ring any alarm bells because the name Colleen Ritzer hadn't shown up on his alert yet. They ask Philip, you know, do you have anything on you that could hurt us. And Philip lets them know that his backpack is filled with survival gear. So they search his backpack and they find a bloody box cutter. In the backpack, they also find a pair of underwear, several credit cards and a driver's license, all belonging to Colleen. When questioned about all these items he had with him, Philip says he just found them at a stop and shop and then later changes his story to he found them in a car. When the officers asked Philip, well, where did the blood come from? He simply responds, the girl. He then informed them that she was buried in the woods. They then take Philip to the Danvers police station. His mom, Diana, soon arrives, but Philip 
asks to speak to the police without his mother present. Meanwhile, back at the school, the second floor bathroom, the same bathroom that Colleen had left the tutoring session to go and use, although mostly clean, smells like disinfectant, and there were some red brown stains found inside a cubicle. One of these stains looked like a handprint. Drops of blood near the main entrance to the school were also found. Then at 3 a.m. when Philip was being held at the police station, Colleen's family and friends, a few of them, were out searching for her. Todd Butterworth, also a math teacher, was one of the friends looking for Colleen that night, and it was him that found her large, distinctive backpack. Inside the backpack, her pink calculator was found, and it was found wedged between some rocks near the woods, just near the school. He then also saw a white pair of gloves with blood on them and splatters of blood nearby on some leaves. He immediately notified the police. When the police arrived, an officer saw something sticking out from underneath the leaves. It was a human toe with pink nail polish. It was a woman and her body was posed in a sexually suggestive position. She was not wearing any clothing on her lower half and her top was pulled up and her bra was pulled down, exposing her. She was stabbed multiple times and her throat had been cut. And as if that wasn't enough, the most upsetting part to me. She had a one inch in diameter, three foot long tree branch inserted inside her chest. Near the body, they also found a pair of socks, gloves, pieces of paper, and a backpack with Philip's ID sitting on top of it. Many of these items were covered in what looked like blood and on a piece of paper folded neatly near the body was a note written in blue marker that said, I hate you all. The body was confirmed to be Colleen Ritzer. A paramedic was called who cleared the leaves surrounding her body, placed a stethoscope on her chest and pronounced her dead at the scene. The cause of death was asphyxiation and 16 stab wounds, which hit major blood vessels. And she was only 24 years old. Now, clearly Philip was involved, but what happened? Fortunately and unfortunately, Danvers High School had recently just installed multiple security cameras all over the school. When police viewed the CCTV footage from that day, what they found was not only shocking, but highly disturbing. And honestly, the footage from that day, I can't even tell you how many times I have watched it, is one of the most disturbing things I've seen. So I've written down sort of a shortened timeline of what happened that day. So that morning, October 22nd, Philip, he arrives at school with multiple bags. He places these bags inside his school locker and later, these bags were found to have had that box cutter, a ski mask, gloves, and several changes of clothes. Later at 2.54 p.m., Colleen is seen on CCTV camera walking out of the classroom and walking to that woman's bathroom on the second floor. Then, not even a minute later, like 2.55 p.m., Philip also leaves the classroom and he's wearing a blue hoodie at the time and he's sort of lingering outside the classroom, almost hesitating, before he pulls his hoodie up over his head and then he walks in the same direction as Colleen. Before he enters that same women's bathroom that Colleen was in, he is seen putting on a pair of white gloves. He then enters the women's bathroom. 11 minutes later, 3.06 p.m., a female student is seen entering that same bathroom and then she leaves just as quickly. 
A minute later at 3.07 p.m., Philip is now seen leaving that bathroom with his hood pulled up and he's holding a black fabric and something white and his right hand is covered in bright red blood. When the student is later questioned by the police, she says she enters the bathroom and as soon as she enters, she sees this naked butt and it looked to her like someone was changing. There was a pile of clothes on the floor and she was really embarrassed and didn't want to intrude on this person changing, so she quickly left. Inside that bathroom, Philip attacked Colleen from behind, strangled her, stabbed her over 16 times with that box cutter, and raped her. For the next few minutes, Philip is seen walking in and out of the building, and when he re-enters, he has just a white t-shirt on. He runs through the school hallway, he even passes another teacher on the way and it looks like that teacher is almost like telling him off for running. He then re-enters Colleen's classroom and grabs Colleen's belongings. After this, he leaves the building. When he comes back, he's wearing a red sweatshirt and he has a black ski mask in his hand. And this time he runs past a student who appears to be trying to talk to him as well. He leaves the school once again and at 3.14 p.m. he returns with a green recycle bin. He wheels this big bin up the stairs, up to the second floor, and then into that women's bathroom at 3.16 p.m. At 3.23 p.m., he is seen exiting the building with this green recycling bin, which now looks a little heavy. And he's dragging it towards this wooded area behind the dumpsters that sits behind the school. He is wearing a ski mask during this time. It was at this time that he placed Colleen's body in the woods, sexually assaulted her with that tree branch and staged the crime scene. At 3.30 p.m., the mother of another student sees Philip running away from the school. At 4 p.m., Philip re-enters the building. This time, he's barefoot and his jeans are covered in blood. Then at 4.05 p.m., he goes into a different school bathroom and he emerges wearing his soccer uniform. He then goes back to the second floor bathroom, goes inside and then comes out a minute later and then leaves the school building again. At 4.30 p.m. Philip goes to Wendy's, buys a burger using Colleen's credit card. He then goes to that Hollywood Hits movie theater and watches a Woody Allen movie called Blue Jasmine. It was near this theater that police found both Philip's and Colleen's smashed mobile phones. Then at 6.34 p.m., his mother Diana reported him missing. Philip Chisholm was arrested for the murder, aggravated rape, and armed robbery of Colleen Ritzer. His trial began in November 2015, where he pled not guilty by reason of insanity. He was tried as an adult after a mental competency hearing took place. Philip barely spoke during his entire trial. Prior to this, on June 2nd, 2014, while awaiting trial at the Metro Youth Services Facility in Boston, Philip tried to strangle a female youth worker as she was exiting the locker room bathroom. He kicked off his sandals, which he knew was gonna make a noise as he approached her. So he was barefoot, he had a pencil in one hand, and when she came out of the bathroom, he stared at her for a little bit before placing both hands around her neck and choking her while pushing her back against a wall. She was unable to scream, but she managed to get his right hand away from her neck and he then punched her in her face, head, and jaw. She then screamed for help and other staff members were able to come save her and restrain him. He ended up getting two additional charges of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, which was the pencil that he attempted to stab her with. A judge ended up sending him to Worcester State Hospital to get a mental health evaluation due to the psychotic symptoms he was exhibiting. During this encounter with the female, 
youth worker, he was screaming and foaming at the mouth. And at this hospital, he was eventually diagnosed, treated, and medicated. The victim, the female youth worker, she suffered bruises to her face, jaw, and head, along with a scratch on her back consistent with a tear in her shirt, which came from the pencil. So he almost stabbed her. During the trial for Colleen's murder, the defense did not argue whether Philip killed Colleen or not. This, in fact, was true. But they stated that the attack happened due to a word that Colleen had used. This word brought on his psychotic symptoms. That word was Tennessee. They argued that Philip did not know right from wrong, that he struggled from his move from Tennessee, moving to this new school, making new friends, socializing. His home life included his father's abuse, abandonment issues, unpredictability, and a divorce. His mother moved Philip and his siblings from Tennessee to Danvers, something that Philip was really against, and the adjustment for him was extremely difficult. A psychologist also testified that Philip most likely had early onset schizophrenia. However, the prosecution did not agree with this. They came at him hard, which a lot of people disagreed with. They talked about how this shy and seemingly well-behaved freshman was evil. Evil enough to plan out the vicious attack and murder of a teacher who not only cared about him, who helped him, but who supported him at school. They talked about how he prepared himself with a murder kit at school, that he had violent tendencies prior to this horrific killing. They accused him of torturing cats and setting them on fire before his move to Danvers. Basically, during the trial, there was a lot of back and forth between numerous mental health professionals on whether Philip was mentally ill or not. Defense witnesses said he was ill, prosecution witnesses said he was not. That while he was disturbed, his capacity to distinguish between right and wrong was not altered. But it was obvious that Philip had planned this attack. He came to school with a murder kit. It was not Colleen's fault using the word Tennessee at the end of the day during this tutoring session that caused this psychotic break. And you know what's wild? The defense also wanted the sexual assault on Colleen, you know, with the tree branch, to be thrown out because they were like, well, she was already dead at that point. So like, why include the charge? And I know the defense is just doing their job. You know, there's a law in Massachusetts stating that for a rape to occur, a victim has to be alive. There is no law for abuse on a corpse, but like, imagine having to ask that. There's the victim right there and you're like, yeah, so just throw away that sexual assault because I mean, she was already dead. It's just, ugh. The prosecution painted the horrifying image of poor Colleen, stripped, beaten, stabbed, assaulted, not once, but twice, left in the woods in this humiliating sexual position. What a brutal and senseless murder for Colleen and her family to have to endure. One frustrating piece of evidence, and although I'm not sure how much this would have helped the case, I mean, evidence is evidence, right? But if you're wondering like I was, like how the hell do you stab someone 16 times and clean the bathroom after with no cleaning supplies? Like there was never any CCTV footage showing Philip attempting to clean the bathroom. So I was like, was, wasn't there like blood everywhere. So this is what happened. A cleaner had attended that bathroom at school that day. This cleaner recalled that the bathroom looked like a slaughterhouse. He goes downstairs and tells a custodian in broken English what he had found. He said, I find blood in the women's bathroom in the second floor. But the custodian, I guess the manager, heard blue, not blood. So he pictured blue cleaning fluid, like maybe window cleaning fluid, had spilled, not blood. So he just tells the supervisor like, yeah, so just go clean it. Like, what do you want me to do about it? So he sent this cleaning supervisor off with a hose to wash away most of the blood that was left behind in this bathroom. <sighs> like what? And then later a diamond earring was found in blood filled floor cleaner 
that this cleaner had used to scrub and squeegee the floor in the bathroom. Like, I mean, don't ask me what the fuck happened because what? Who doesn't report this? Like broken English or not, blood is blood. You would have smelled the blood. It would have had to have been a lot of blood if he claimed it to look like a slaughterhouse. Like what? Don't ask me. On February 26th, 2016, Philip was found guilty of first degree murder with deliberate premeditation and extreme atrocity or cruelty, but not guilty of aggravated. He was also found guilty of armed robbery for stealing Colleen's credit card. Philip was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years for the murder charge, plus two sentences of 40 years each for the robbery charge to be served concurrently. He was also ordered to undergo psychiatric treatment while in custody. Colleen's family was extremely upset by this stupid sentence, extremely low sentence. They wanted life for Philip Chisholm. They stated, we are devastated and feel betrayed with Judge Lowy's inability to give three consecutive life sentences without the eligibility of parole to the individual that took Colleen's life in such a horrific manner. We are disgusted and personally offended with the defense's repulsive recommendation that Colleen's killer be parole eligible within 15 years, therefore putting him back into society at the age of 29 to kill again. The defense's legal maneuvering is despicable and demonstrates utmost disrespect for our daughter and sister Colleen's life. Evil cannot be rehabilitated. The funeral for Colleen was held on October 28th, 2013, and she was laid to rest in the Spring Grove Cemetery in her hometown of Andover. Colleen was a beloved member of society, her friends, her family, the school, and according to one student who was struggling, stated that Colleen was always positive and happy. She said, she made me feel like I wanted to go to math class. Following Colleen's horrific death, her family created the Colleen Ritzer Memorial Fund, which funds scholarships and grants for aspiring teachers. And they have honestly started such wonderful initiatives, which can be found on their website, which I will link below. This case is so tricky because it deals with a child. In my research, I've read so many factors about why people say that Philip being tried as an adult was wrong. I mean, there are a lot of things people under 18 can't do and that's for a good reason, like smoke, drink alcohol, get married. And they say that this is because they are considered too immature to handle these acts. But then to be, you know, considered a child immature for a lot of things, but then to plan and calculate and carry out an act of this nature, a crime, commit a murder, what does that deserve? You know, a slap on the wrist and a cuddle? I really don't know if I agree with that. You do grown up shit, you face grown up consequences. Many people believe that Philip was not psychotic. Perhaps he had an underlying mental illness, but does it warrant no penalty for his actions? Was this Philip's first crime? The calm demeanor in which he brings this murder kit to school, places it in his locker, follows his teacher into the bathroom, puts gloves on before entering to retain evidence. I mean, it's all very twisted and sinister, no? The fact that he was willing to attack someone in a public bathroom, yes, school was done, less people around, but it's all still very confident. Let's hope his parole is rejected many times and he actually receives the help he needs behind bars. What do you guys think about this case? I would love to hear your thoughts below. Let's keep Colleen's family in our thoughts and prayers. And I will see you in next week's video, guys. Besitos. Bye.